Here's what's happening. The goal is to have some sort of dinky little light pre-pass renderer up and running as quickly as possible. I'll start the timer and try to bang this out over the course of a day. Now it's been about a million years since I was a real game programmer, so I'll probably get a whole bunch of things wrong. 3D engines at a high level aren't that complex. They tend to have some nice abstractions around a few key concepts, like you need to abstract away the state of the renderer, there's a bunch of things that are reasonably common, like having a camera so that we can easily view the scene from various angles, a mesh, model, drawable type of thing representing objects in the scene, a material or shader for representing things like uh, how they should look. These are all pretty common patterns. Then it needs to understand materials, like what order to draw things, that sort of stuff. There's a bunch of crap I'm intentionally skipping, like visibility system, loading, pretty much a million things, but that's the basics. The rough plan is get something on the screen, start getting some of those parts working, like the camera, the mesh material, try getting those parts working together, and getting the various passes in. In more technical terms, this means that we need to initialize WebGL, get our abstractions working, that would be like mesh, shader, camera, get FBOs working, or frame buffer objects, and then finally get the various stages of a light prepass renderer in place, like Z prepass and normals, light buffer generation, and the forward opaque pass. The first thing we need to do is start a new project, so I'll just go make a new directory. Let's call this WebGL One Day 3D Engine. Nice and straightforward name, and we'll need a few files too, so I'll just go ahead and make the index.html and main.js that we'll be working from. So traditionally, I've always used DirectX or other things, never had much fondness for OpenGL. In fact, I find it really, really hard to work with. And 3JS is a really good 3D library, so I've never had much reason to use WebGL directly. The first thing we need to do is initialize WebGL. And we'll just start by searching for a tutorial. I always find Mozilla's docs to be super helpful, so we'll head straight there. Looking over the code in here, this looks pretty simple. Just a few lines of code and we should be up and running. In C++, this would be way more code, just because. But in JavaScript, it looks like it's just going to be a breeze. In our code, I've just created this basic renderer class that I'll be fleshing out over time, and I just copied the initialization code wholesale right into it. And like the docs say, once I run it, I get a big black box. So we're off to a good start. Maybe, probably. One thing to note is that uh, I want to use WebGL 2 and not have to deal with the crap ton of extensions and other BS that WebGL 1 has to deal with. So in the code, that just means we need to change this line here from WebGL to WebGL 2. The first thing I want to do is get something on the screen. So we're creating this mesh class to wrap the vertex data. It's going to do just a few simple things. It'll need to define some data. Let's say we'll make a cube so that we need to define a bunch of position data. And we'll need to define some index data. The mesh class will also need to send the data to OpenGL to upload to the GPU, which means we need to create buffers for each data stream, and then actually buffer the data. You can see this function does exactly that, creates a buffer and follows that with the buffer data call. We do make a distinction here between normal vertex data and indices. It's not perfect, but it'll work. Don't really want to get too hung up on detail since I'm in a hurry. Lastly, this needs to bind the buffers when we go to draw this thing. So we have this bind function here, and all it does is binds the various buffers that make up this 3D object. In our case, it's just positions and indices, but later we'll include other data like normal and tangent data as well. Oh, and we'll also need to draw. Can't really do it much without that, so luckily it's just a couple lines. We can't really see if this works yet because we need a material of some kind to assign there. So let's get a shader material thing going. First thing we need to do is go and create a shader class. And it'll be a simple class with just a few basic responsibilities. It needs to take the vertex and fragment source code. It needs to compile them. And then it needs to get some data back from the compiled source about where the buffers and uniforms are bound. So we have these load calls, which when you look inside the function definition, they just take the source and type of program. They create a shader, send the source code, then we compile it, and this block of code here, all it does is checks if everything succeeded or not, and if it didn't, it dumps it out on the console. Anyway, that means that we'll need to define a simple shader too. What we'll do here is just define some colors for each side of the cube first. So go back to the mesh class and define a few colors, and then buffer them. 
Now, in our shader here, we don't need to do that much. The vertex shader needs to transform the position, which means we need some uniforms to define the world, view, and projection matrices. We'll pass the vertex color via the varying attribute down to the fragment shader, and we'll output the vertex color multiplied by the texture directly as the fragment output. What this means is we'll need a way to bind the uniform values and supply them to the shader. So this bind function on the shader will do just that. It just sets the uniforms we need. That also means we need to actually load a texture. So let's also do that. We'll create this quick texture class with a load function, and this is almost copy-pasted straight out of the Mozilla docs. We have a simple load function followed by some bind and unbind methods. Now let's add a shader to the mesh class. So, inside the bind function, when we go to bind the mesh, we also bind the shader. That way, when we're ready to draw the mesh, we have all the specific shader data. So now we draw, and there we go, cube there. Doesn't look like much, so let's go back into the code and make it spin a bit, so that you can see that it's a cube. We'll add some quick methods to expose things like position and rotation to the mesh class here, and now that just means that we need to add rotation to the model matrix. We'll do that right here in the render function for now, and when we load it up, we have a spinny cube thing. We're definitely making a lot of progress here, even though it doesn't seem like we have anything up, and this is all pretty trivial. So we have a mesh, and we have a shader. Now the problem is, if I want to define a second cube with a second shader, it's totally possible. I could just write that right here in the renderer like this, and it would work. But remember, the shader class also compiles the source, and the mesh class creates a new set of buffers, so this is all super wasteful. What we want is to make a distinction between the source and an instance. We'll create two new classes, mesh instance and shader instance. And what these will do is represent a specific instance of an object in the world. Think of it as the difference between a blueprint of an object and actual instances in the world with their own position, rotation, that kind of thing. So we have these two new classes, Mesh Instance and Shader Instance. Let's look at what they need to do. Mesh Instance needs its own Shader Instance, since it'll need to set its own uniform values. It also needs to track position, rotation, scale with functions to be able to set those. Finally, we need a way to set up the draw call, so we need to create a bind function that sets up the various matrices and also binds the mesh data itself. The shader instance class is also going to be slightly different from the shader class. What it needs to do is make a copy of all the uniform values from the shader, but the key difference here is that we'll also have the value that needs to be set. So then, in the bind function, we can just loop over each of the uniforms and we can set each one. Nothing super complicated in here, there's just one small gotcha with the textures and that you need to manage the texture index yourself. So we just keep a texture index variable here that gets incremented with every texture that gets bound. So now, back to where we wanted to define a second cube. Now we can do that easily, by defining a couple of mesh instances and just repositioning them apart. There we go, got a couple of spinny cubes. Might seem like a lot of work for little gain, again, but you've got the bones in place for so much more now. So we've got some things drawing. We need to start building out the actual renderer. The first thing we need to do is create some FBOs, or frame buffer objects. These just seem to be OpenGL's way of supporting render targets, but you know, difficult to use because OpenGL. So we'll go to find some FBOs. Let's make this init G buffer function, so we need to go and create that. What you need to do is create a bunch of textures. So we define the depth buffer and normal texture here, and the normal texture will be a floating point texture instead of the usual 8-bit RGBA. We'll make it the same width and height as the window, and then down here we'll create a frame buffer and attach the various textures to it. We'll need to make a slight change to the render function at this point. Now we need to use this bind frame buffer and draw buffers calls to set up the frame buffer, and now we'll draw out all the normals for the scene, and this didn't work, I just got a black screen. There's a bunch of spew in the console about frame buffer incomplete. Knew that my lack of error checking would come back to bite me. Anyway, ended up googling around for a while and screwing around uh, probably for an hour or two since I have no idea what frame buffer incomplete means other than I've screwed up something to do with the frame buffer object creation, obviously. After consulting Stack Overflow and various other sources, it turns out that you need to do a somewhat magical call to enable floating point textures with this line, gl.extension ext color buffer float. After that, things worked fine. I can write the normals to the buffer and bind and use that texture. So to do lighting properly, I need to reconstruct the world's space position inside the fragment shader. 
So I need a way to do that using the data from the Z prepass normal pass. It's actually not super hard to recreate it from the depth buffer, but I just wasted a bunch of time screwing around with getting just FBOs working, and I'm, I wasn't confident about getting the depth reads working quickly. So I opted for a second texture that just stored the positions. So we go back to the FBO definition, and we define a second floating point texture for world space positions, and then we bind it to the frame buffer object. Now, just a small change to the render function, and we'll change the shader to also output position, and I ended up with this. It wasn't working again. Normals are working fine, but the world space position isn't. I thought this was going to be easier than getting the depth buffer reads working, but right now it's not looking good. I'll save you all the debugging steps, but uh, it turns out I just missed an S here, so that was a total waste of time. This is what it should look like. The next step is generating the light buffer, and in light prepass, this is just a pass that takes in the normal and position, and accumulates the lighting contribution in a new buffer. So we loop over the lights, and then we draw a screen space quad. Down here in the fragment shader is where the real work is done. Depending on which light we're using, we read the normal position textures, and then we calculate the lighting contribution at that point on the screen. That's a simple n.l for the diffuse, and then the Blinfong specular uses the normal halfway vector raised to an exponent. I just hard-coded one here because I'm trying to get this done. I'll come back around if I have time. And since we're using just one buffer for the lighting, the specular color isn't preserved, and we only have the intensity and the W component. Once we do that, we can output the light buffer to confirm it's all working, and we've got some lighting on the scene. Adding more lights is just a matter of blending them additively onto the buffer. So if we enable blending and set the blend function to 1, 1, then we can define a whole bunch of lights, and suddenly the scene is full of lights. The last step. We need to go back and add one more pass. This is the opaque pass, where we actually draw the objects with their textures and whatever else. This means going back and defining yet another frame buffer object and creating the textures that it needs. These don't have to be floating point textures at this point, and in fact we could just draw directly to the main frame buffer and not use an FBO, but I'll use a frame buffer object with floating point textures because we could potentially tack on some post effects, or tone mapping, or something like that. Now it's a matter of looping through each mesh instance again and drawing them. But last time we did this, all the meshes output normal in position, and this time we need them to use a different shader. Which means we need each mesh to support having multiple shaders, so we need to make some small changes around here. We'll add this parameter to the bind function that lets you specify which pass you're doing. Then when we create a mesh, instead of passing in a single shader instance, we'll pass in a dictionary with multiple shader instances, and it'll be keyed off the pass name. So here we create a mesh instance, and it'll have a pass called Z, and that uses the Z shader. And then it'll have another pass called color, and that uses whatever shader was specified in the parameters. This is what the color shader will look like. It's a simple shader that samples the screen space light buffer and multiplies it against the diffuse texture. Now, when we go render, we specify what pass we're doing so that the mesh knows which shader to bind, and we have a whole bunch of spinny cubes up, with lights moving around the scene randomly. Everything kind of looks wet because of the specular, but whatever. I'm making the tech, not the art. At this point, we're mostly done. Uh, this isn't efficient, and a whole lot of things could be done a zillion times better. I ended up going back, and instead of a full screen quad, I switched this to uh, add a set quad size for light, and ended up burning the rest of my evening screwing around with this. The whole point here is if you have a light on the screen, you don't need to render the entire screen to get that light's influence. You can just render a small quad. So if you can figure out the screen space extents of that quad, then you can just render a small quad and be done. For this demo, it really made no difference whatsoever, but I thought I could squeeze it in. But I couldn't. I tried projecting the light center to screen space, then from view space calculating up and right and using the radius, and then getting a bounding box from that, but I kept getting a cutoff light. So something was going wrong. Maybe I'd been sitting at my laptop way too long. Maybe it was because I was also drinking beer at this point. But uh, anyway, finally found my error the next day. My quad was only half sized, so I needed to multiply by two. Yeah, That's where things ended up. Not gonna lie, this is one steaming pile of code. Not the greatest, but it works, sort of. And maybe you, if you watched this all the way through, maybe you got something out of it. Source code is available. Like always, go browse it on GitHub. I promise I remembered to upload this time. Look, I even put it in the video as proof. Leave a comment, tell me what you thought, and what should I work on next? Cheers.